I wish I could tell you the truth, but the truth is unspeakable, unthinkable, because we are bigger than the box, pale shadows of full potential, because we can raise ourselves to our highest ideals or dash ourselves against the rocks, because we could be giants, but choose to chase illusions and make love to shadows, rather than kicking the walls of this pathetic pygmy hut down. Enough is enough, because I am not this body. I have a body, but I am not the body. Because I am not emotion. I have emotions, but I am not emotion. I think, but I am not thought. I am I, a pure spark of consciousness. And I am not alone, a teacher amongst teachers, learning from you and those I love, growing with your help, knowing that the game is as big, as fast, precise, as gentle as we define it to be, because the mind is an open sky, stretching from horizon to horizon, because the heart is a sunrise or a green field, because the spirit is a light in the darkness, a wildfire, a blaze of eternal incandescent glory that never can be described, because this is not a poem, this is a call to arms, a wake-up call from coincidence control, and you, you know all this already, because all this is true, and the truth is unspeakable. And that was sort of my mission statement back in 1994, uh, uh, just a, a way to sum up what I felt and what I believed at the time. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Mark, um, my name's Mark Patrick, um, uh, I'm a human being, uh, <laughs> you know, I was born in Bristol, well I, I grew up in Bristol, I was born in the West Bromwich, moved here when I was five, um, I had um, quite an interesting mix of philosophy and psychology and religion as I grew up, and uh, I trained as a hypnotherapist when I was 23. Um, and I've generally tried to promote an understanding of the mechanics of the mind and uh, the role of belief and belief systems. Yeah. That's what I'm interested in really, the subject of belief and how we construct our beliefs. So uh, how do you feel about current society and how beliefs are structured at the moment? Well, our society is always um, it's really a war between competing stories of the world. Um, we have the, the dominant culture, which is primarily consumer culture, capitalist culture, um, which is mostly about quantities rather than qualities, and how useful something is um, rather than how beautiful. Uh, and um, as a the poem said, um, a lot, I think a lot of us feel that, uh, that we have more to offer than the boxes present or the roles present. And uh, I'm very interested in uh, sort of helping that to emerge mm -hmm. and come through and for the message of uh, spirituality to be heard, in fact. Yeah. You know, because uh, the um, sort of spiritual view of the ages has always been one where The, story, the spiritual story is that there is only one thing in the universe. Yes, underneath um, all appearances, that there is a unity that binds us all together. Yes, and what is looking through my eyes is essentially what's looking through your eyes or the starling's eyes. Yes, all the senses of the uh, the flower on the windowsill. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how society, to, to, for us to develop to our true self, how do, how do things need to change, or do they need to change? How do they need to change? I think um, I can only deal with changing myself. That's where it starts for me. Yes? I can't enforce any change on anybody else, and neither would I want to. Um, it's a case of recognition before people can start to grow. Yeah, the first thing we have to do is recognise that it's there, it's in potential. 
Yes, and recognise the, the, the methods, the tools, the maps and the models that will get us there. Uh, I can't deal with, I, I think it's uh, almost pointless to try and struggle against a global issues, yes, as an individual. The only way we can do it is collectively, yes, so if, if you have a particular uh, issue that you want to um, uh, work with, then find others, mm -hmm. yeah, who are going to work the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like just creating, surrounding yourself with might minded people to then change things and move forward. Well, to me, it happens on a very small uh, scale. It may be simply smiling at somebody mm -hmm. as you walk down the street, yeah. yeah, or just offering a hand where you might have walked past. You know, it's, it really is on that that personal level. Yes, and I think that's how things will change. If everybody starts to recognise other people as individuals, yeah, that there is no such thing as an average, yeah, or, a, I mean, yes, stereotypes are based on something, some qualities. Yeah, and too often we fall into just looking at um, people as stereotypes. Yeah, uh, I think it's Terence McKenna who uh, talks about the uh, says the sampling rate is low, which is why we um, uh, end up seeing people as stereotypes. The detail's gone. Yes, it, it comes from not moving with awareness or uh, mindfulness in your life. Yeah, this pace of rush, 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 where we're constantly f uh, focused on uh, living on emergency rather than taking our time. And so always we have to um, the gates of closure, yeah, the shutter comes down really fast because we have to make a split decision. Yeah, so we can't see the spectrum, we can't see the greys, it becomes black or white, the rainbow gets destroyed, it has to be plus or minus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And society in general structures, is structured so you're stressed, so you're always busy, you're always chasing your tail, so there aren't really any opportunities to um as i started with um we can raise ourselves to our highest ideals or dash ourselves against the rocks but choose to taste uh, to chase illusions and make love to shadows <laughs> yes we do yes um and that can happen on any, any level, um, with our bodies, yes, if we're with a particular body state, yeah, um, and we get identified with it too much, it will become a state of tension. If in our feelings, yes, it will become a hang-up, yeah, it will become a, a feeling that we revisit over and over again and there's no movement there, it becomes frozen, it's stuck. Um, these are all the things that block us. Uh, our desires, if we identify too strongly with them, yeah, they become cravings and addictions. Mm -hmm. um, opinions become prejudices, roles become masks, mm -hmm. you know, and um, we stop acting from our centres in a true and open, genuine way. Yeah, yeah. So, um, previously you were saying you've done hypnotherapy. So how did learning hypnotherapy make you see the world in a different light? Interesting question. Um, okay. Um, well, I, I essentially learned hypnotherapy by picking up a book when I was 11 and hypnotizing people at school and almost got expelled a couple of times. I, I think I, um, I made most of my mistakes back then. <laughs> um, and I, I learned fairly quickly that um, you had to be very careful with suggestion because it can be quite a powerful force. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're subjected to all the time, yeah, yeah. you know, um, from the media, yeah, from friends, from parents, yeah, other role models and so forth. Uh, and it's true that if we're told something a certain number of times, um, it becomes an experiential reality, it becomes part of our worldview, it becomes part of our being, part of our experience, part of who we are. 
uh, on a very simple level, if you're told that Heineken or one of these brand beers yeah, tastes better than another one, yes, mm. often enough, eventually it will start to taste better to you. Yeah. Yes, so, so we learn to translate and modify our experiences yeah, through what we tell ourselves. Yeah, and one of the things I want to get across is that there are tools whereby we can take that power back into our own lives, yes, and learn to live in the realities that we wish to uh, live in, whilst maintaining contact with consensus, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to explore, um, but you always have to have a place to return to. Yes, as, as a ground zero, yes. Um, and for me, that place is um, a place where you're able to sit and watch your thoughts go by that there is a, a, a clear and empty space in the self that you can return to. That's ground zero, yes? And from that point, you can believe yourself into almost anything, yeah? And if you know how, return to that place and step out of whatever belief system you've built up. So what sort of techniques through hypnosis can you use to empower yourself? Ah, we're talking self-empowerment. <coughs> hmm. And one of the simplest uh, ones is uh, to create, um, to use an image of some kind. Uh, ritual magicians have always used the um, idea of god forms, yeah, and goddess forms, um, where if you've got a particular stressful meeting coming up, yes, and you want to be powerful in that meeting. Yeah, you may actually create an image for yourself yeah, of, say, Thor, the god of thunder. Yes? Very strong, very powerful image, commanding the winds, etc. Warrior archetype. Yes? And you identify with that. Yes? Because, uh, as I've said, if you can disidentify yourself with a feeling, a thought, uh, a bodily um, a sensation, yes? then you can also identify yourself with things. Yes, and think yourself or believe yourself into that position and it becomes a reality for you. Yeah, so you can take some of those qualities of, say, the God of Thunder or a bear, yes, as the Amarins might do, yes, with you into that meeting as courage. Or, if you're a Christian, yes, right, you, could, uh, you can offer it up to, to a higher power, yeah, like your personal idea of God uh, or Jesus Christ. Um, I don't. I, I believe that each system is valid, yeah, and useful in its own place. And people just have different ways of going about these things that are, are individual. So, how do we actually get ourselves into non-ordinary states of reality, and what are the benefits of them? This is something that you seem to be asking. Yeah. Um, meditation, prayer, dancing, singing. Playing drums, repetitive beat, repetitive beats. Um, some people use chemistry. Some people use yoga. Some people might use massage. Yes. Um, usually, anything that either quietens the senses or overstimulates them will create a window of opportunity. Yes, for you to actually input suggestions of your own. Yeah, or absorb them from outside. Yes, in a more intense way than normal. Yeah, so we're able to use that, that, that window. Um, I think Carlos Castaneda uh, talks it in terms of moments of power. Yes, where, where there's a, a window of opportunity where you can take advantage of the fact that your usual way of being and thinking yes, is suspended because your patterns have been broken, your, your habitual ways of going through the world. And most of us go through the world effectively half asleep because we're running on habit and autopilot mm. yeah we're letting the, the horse drive the the, um, the carriage rather than yeah it's my metaphor for that would be is it, most people like a stagnant pond and they become stagnant in their beliefs and the way they are but as soon as you start flowing like the river or you dance or you you start moving that energy within you starts moving and that releases, absolutely releases it all and then that, that helps you move along, bit by bit it gets you to where I've heard many people discuss it in the same way, and I, I was thinking about that uh, just a couple of moments ago. <laughs> um, so, yeah. 
So, um, where are we? Um, I wouldn't regard myself as a skeptic, yeah, because skepticism, although I take everything with a pinch of salt, um, I only trust what I've experienced myself to a large extent. Yes, if I've experienced something, then I know it has been so for me during that space and that time. Very often things are only true for one moment, mm -hmm. yes. Um, a great example is um, water, yes. If you, I ask anybody watching this um, what temperature water boils at, they probably go, ah, 100 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. But that's not true if you're below sea level or above sea level, mm -hmm. yes, because uh, the air pressure will mean that it will boil quicker or slower. So it will boil at 101 degrees or 99 degrees. Yeah. Um, the same with most of the things we take for granted. They are only true in a particular context. Mm. See, even the measurement of 100 degrees is a theory, which we've all adapted, and that's what where it, you know, it could have been any number. Oh, it could have been, yes. Yeah, it could have been 27 blue yeah. bunnies, for yeah. all I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but... Um, so, things are true, yeah, at a particular time, for a particular space, yeah. yeah, so I can only say, in my opinion, yeah, yeah. yes, the way I see things now, I see it as this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as I said, yes, um, I wouldn't call myself a sceptic, because scepticism um, doesn't question the status quo. Mm -hmm. It will question everything else, but the ground it's standing on. Yeah, I'd call myself a zeticist, and if you want to go ahead and uh, look the word up, yeah, it, it just means that you will also doubt yeah, the status quo. Mm -hmm. Yes, everything is up for grabs to be questioned. And I think the questions are all often more important than the answers. Mm -hmm. yeah, because the answers are often very temporary depending on how our maps and models change mm -hmm. yes, over time. Mm -hmm. Because what is now true will not necessarily be true yes, in a hundred years. We will have different ways of looking at the same same picture. Yeah, um, Jimmy Savile. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Uh, what? Two months ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Was a good person. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. right. And now he's a de and now he's a demon. Yeah. You know. Yeah, because w what we know about the situation has changed our perception of it. <laughs> um, and. At one time, we thought the world was flat, mm -hmm. yeah, and at the moment, we think it's round, mm -hmm. yes, and we think the universe may actually be truly infinite, mm -hmm. because we can't actually find a curved boundary out there any, anywhere, according mm -hmm. to the latest Horizon programs. Based on our measuring systems. Of course, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, um, all we know is the way we translate the world, mm -hmm. yes, whether we're using instruments like the cameras, the microphone, things like that. Yes, or our own nervous system. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. everything I know about the world is in my head. Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. picture I generate, yeah. and that picture is made out of just a handful of bits of information, out of the hundred thousand bits of information that come into my uh, my brain and nervous system. Yeah, every split second, we take a tiny handful. Yeah, and we tend to build our picture of the universe out of that. Yeah, there are plenty of things we always filter out. Yeah, in order yeah. to live comfortably. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that, that aren't biologically relevant and would have been a distraction. Yeah, if we were trying to focus on catching that rabbit. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, as I think, as we've we our society and as uh, individuals, as we've evolved, um, we're actually beginning to pick up on more and more of those signals. Yes, as I said, a lot of it is about awareness and allowing our, our own awareness to unfold. Um, I mean, it's uh, our reality does depend so much on the way we feel, a lot of us, uh, and the way we think, and the way that we've um, been programmed or have accepted programming. Because 
when I was first, um, when I first came out of the womb, yes, all I knew was to approach that which, uh, which we, uh, I felt was good, yeah, and retreat from that, contract away from that which uh, was bad. Mm. Yes, exactly like an amoeba. <coughs> yeah, single-celled life form, yes, right, used to do this. Mm. Yes, and we actually copy it as we grow as individuals. So, in the same way that um, we went through all the physical stages in the womb, yes, of the amoeba, the reptile, etc., which we do, when we emerge from the womb, yes, we start to go through it psychologically, yeah, yeah in terms of consciousness. And and we recapitulate what has happened in evolutionary terms. So when I was a toddler, too, yes, all of a sudden I'm rising up against gravity, yes, right, insisting on territory, the terrible twos, yes, I'm bigger than you, I'm smaller than you, yeah, just like uh, something crawling out of the sea and standing up on its back legs, yeah, then life started to, uh, to uh, develop vague sort of symbol systems, yes, barks, tweets, things like this, finally language, yes, just as a child does as it's growing up, yeah, language is programmed into us, we will develop some kind of language all by ourselves, yes, in the same way, and at each stage, yes, there's an imprinting period where we've got that, where you've got that moment of opportunity, that window of opportunity, it's called imprint vulnerability, yes, which defines how you're going to, on the level of the body, yes, relate to your environment. Are you going to be physically afraid or physically dominant? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or in terms of emotion, yes. Are you going to go, I'm okay? Yes, you're okay. Or are you going to go, I'm bad, you're bad? Or some combination. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with developing of the mind. If there is plenty of things to play with and hold on to, yes, if, we, uh, if there are a lot of symbol systems around, yeah, like, say, music, mathematics, all of them languages, yes, um, <laughs> yeah, visual, uh, other visual languages like the arts and things like that, then we're going to create bigger pictures of the world. Um, one of my friends once said to me, you know when you're getting smarter because your world is getting bigger. You know when you're getting stupider because your world is getting smaller. <laughs> um, so we've covered what um, Robert Anton Wilson and Tim Leary called the first the nervous, circuits in the nervous system. You've got your biological survival, um, and certain drugs will take you back there. Things like opium, heroin, yeah, will turn you into that little kid, yeah, and activate just the, the self-protective side. Alcohol is an obvious one, uh, which uh, plugs into the emotional territorial side. You. You just have to watch the way people behave yeah. <laughs> on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. yeah, things like tea, coffee, um, amphetamines, yeah, tend to activate. Uh, high protein diets will activate the um, uh, symbol dex territory. Yes, um, and then we mature, mature soci uh, sexually and socially, and try and find ourselves. Mm -hmm. In a very good example of this is. Uh, uh, groups of teenagers, yes, well, they're packs of hunter-gatherers yeah. going out with their, their spears and yeah. in their tribal groups, yeah. yeah, and once again, yeah, they're mirroring the evolution of the race as individuals, yes. Um, that's as far as many of us get, the uh, role of father, uh, mother, yes, trying to pass on the information we have, yes, at that point, but through using things like meditation, yoga, um, the shock effects of certain drugs, yes, and I have to say here that I would say that uh, you need to be very careful, yes, um, with using drugs. I go with meditation every time, or prayer, or yoga. Um, they can be very physically damaging, yes, and can be addictive and you can just get stuck at that one level using that one method and it can eat up your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, um, shamanism is full of stories 
uh, of people who have been eaten uh, alive by uh, the various plant spirits. Yes, um, and we see it in our own culture so often. There comes a point where you've disengaged from the lower circuits, so where you're able to sit and watch your own programming run by itself. This often comes from periods of meditation, although there are other ways to get there. Um, Leary and Wilson call that the metaprogramming circuit, where you can actually start to manage yes, your, your own world, your own experience. Yeah, and you can, you can work with it in, in various ways. Um, very often one of the things you get accompanying that is a sense of bliss as well. Yeah, a sense of unity, sense of bliss. I mean, personally, I like sitting in the space where I don't have to be part of anyone or hold any one belief system. You know, uh, able to tune in or see the benefits of any belief system. I, there are simple exercises you can work, do to work with the duality of the mind. Yeah, to take you, you out of it. Um, one is, if you're, you're used to reading very liberal li uh, literature, yeah, read something by a fascist, mm -hmm. yes, right, to balance the view, yes. Try and get into those belief systems that you normally ignore, those ways of looking at the world, because it'll instantly expand your area of consciousness, yeah, the number of viewpoints you have to build your world. Some, some people just gather knowledge and don't experience any of the knowledge and then it just become a, you know, a lot of useless knowledge. <laughs> you have to work with these things. Uh, yeah. It's all about personal work. Yes, because I used to do that myself. Really? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until... Um, it wasn't until I, I had my heart attack. And... Um, end up coming back from the dead, yeah, my own near-death experience, that I began to realise that I had to put, start putting some of this into, into practice on a personal level, rather than just being the person who knew it without using it. Yes, I mean, um, until it becomes real for you, until it becomes a living experience, um, any amount of knowledge is dead. Uh, but this is what I'm saying. Um, ooh. An example. Um, Out-of-body experience. Yeah, as an example. Uh, you can read all the books, you can try all the exercises. Yes, but if you lie down, yes, and you're using auto-suggestion, Yes, you will be able to find yourself in a position where that is an internal reality, that is a reality for you. Um, there's a difference between thinking of a lemon and visualising a lemon. And if I visualise a lemon um, strongly enough, you know, the way its peel is, the way it might be if I cut through it, mm -hmm. you know, the various segments dripping with that bitter juice, yeah, yeah, my mouth might even start to water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're pl playing a video game, yes, your heart will accelerate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we react to uh, non-material objects in the same way yeah. as we would yes, material objects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and being aware of that yeah. actually instantly gives us yes, another world to explore. One of the things that uh, happened for me uh, in a very real way uh, was um, uh, I've had several very strong spiritual experiences recently. Um, and I found that there seem to be two ways that this happens. One, you've got spiritual experience very, very sudden. Once again, takes you out of your programming, your habits, yes and connects you instantly up with this sense of interconnectedness, peace, grace, whatever you choose to call it, stillness, emptiness. Um, and spiritual awareness, which is the other method, which spiritual awakening, sorry, 
which happens very slowly, which is more of an educational variety. Uh, William James talks about that in Varieties of Religious Experience. Um, and for most people, it will happen as a spiritual awakening rather than a, a spiritual thunderbolt. Yeah, very slow, very gentle, unfolding. Um, but now I tend to see... Um, it's just watching birds in the air can do it can trigger that feeling off or, yeah, as I said, sort of sunset. Yeah, or... Um, the sight of, of somebody uh, sort of bending down and helping their child. Yeah. You know, there are so many things that can kick, it, kick that feeling off mm. yeah, and take me out of my, uh, myself, which is what it all seems to be about, getting to this sort of transpersonal level mm. where your own desires yeah, has become so much less important. Mm -hmm. um, because the ego, as I think we were talking, always wants us to be sort of grabbing everything and... Yes, reaffirming our identities by doing that. Everything that is happening yes, is actually quite normal for our stage of development yeah, on this kind of world yeah, and this particular place in the universe. Mm. You know, and that there are probably many, many other um, societies out there, either have been, are, or will be, yeah, that will end up in exactly the same place we are now. Mm. Yes, sort of balanced precariously. Yes, between um, uh, between uh, our instincts and our culture, mm -hmm. you know. So, because we have so many values that we can't live up to, mm -hmm. yeah, as individuals or as a group, we, we have this, we have these really high level values, yes, um, and we tend to feel quite guilty and shameful. Yes, because we can't live up to them. Yeah, and we tend to attack ourselves. Yes, because we can't do that. Or we give up. Yeah. yeah? But we have to remember that, yes, we're half, we are half angel and half beast. Mm. You know? And that's very much um, the realm of somebody's personal evolution to sort out how they're going to deal with that personal darkness. Mm. Yeah? And, and I think it was Jung who said that um, enlightenment isn't about reaching out for the light, but exploring that darkness mm. and coming to terms with it. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Mm. <laughs> but, you know, is, is the culture our culture? And is our root, our, is the country's roots, is that important to, to the people of the country? And ah, we're talking about nationalism and nation states. Yeah, has that Interesting. Been has that been destroyed? Okay, yeah, this is a big, this is a big, this is a big thing. Okay, because um, what you're asking really is where I stand in relation to the idea of new world order, in a way. Well, there needs to be a new <laughs> world order, but it's entities controlling that order. Uh huh. Well, there is a new order coming. I, I've I actually, I have actually begun to think that um, the more something is decentralized. Yes, like with Europe, for instance, yeah, the less power the individual yeah, has. Exactly, yeah, yeah. You know, so with a global government, you'd end up with the power so far out of reach, yeah. yes, dehumanized. completely dehumanised. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and how, how can we uh, fight against that as individuals? Okay. Yeah, um, one way, yes, is to actually um, fight for national identity mm. and for personal difference. And cultural difference and diversity. Then that creates another dynamic. Well. Uh, I know, there are but. No borders, there are no countries. There exactly, are no they're countries. just lines on paper. Humans. But, <laughs> yes, I, I will not die, die for, your, uh, for a piece of coloured cloth. Yeah, no, yeah. yes, <laughs> absolutely, I agree. Yeah. But, yeah, at, right at the moment, yes, in order to prevent this conglomeration into super states, it might be worth fighting to preserve national identity. Yeah, I, I, I think I, <laughs> as a country we've lost our tradition because that was what the, the witch hunt was about. And they, they weren't witches; they were mostly herbalists. In they, in they weren't what they were just the boogeyman. They were the culture, our roots, and they, they've destroyed in most countries. They've destroyed roots. If you look at 
where the warring factions have gone. They've gone into every sovereign country in this world and tried to destroy them. Every country they've invaded has been a sovereign country. And that's where they're going. So it seems like they're destroying groups. But then that whole construct is a construct in the first place. So sometimes you need to con destroy constructs to bring new ones in or to free people from that way of, way of thinking. I don't know, it's a difficult one. Well, I, I also think that um, another uh, good strategy is um, what somebody called the war of art, where you're using um, symbol systems to break symbol systems. Mm -hmm. Yes, where you're, you're creating these moments of, um, as you said, these moments of, uh, these moments of power, these windows of opportunity, yes, um, these pattern breaking moments. Um, um, and that you are, are, are doing things, I think we discussed it, like the Situationists did, mm. yes, when they released purple cows into a supermarket as a protest against uh, mm. um, uh, meat, you know, or um, uh, the whole clown movement that's uh, 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 happening. I don't know if you're aware of that, mm. yeah, where you dress up as a clown, yes, and, and attend a protest. Yes, and, but you don't actually politically protest, you just behave, mm. yes, as a clown would. Yeah. Yes, and that is the protest in itself. Mm. Um, there was one group that uh, I called guerrilla ontology. Mm. Yes, uh, another person called it Operation Mindfuck. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just to, to kickstart people, to try and wake people up to the fact that there is something else going on something more, that we don't have to live in these routines. Oh, yeah. Yes, um, It's a bit like throwing a, a, a monkey wrench into the works. Mm. Yes, um, as the Luddites did, you know, when they were protesting against um, uh, the, um, the uh, early mills and things like this. Yeah, yeah and the cotton machines, the like, early cotton factories and things like this. Because so many people got injured. Yeah, physically in that. And the Luddites went, no, the machines will destroy our, our, our world, you know? But um, too often we throw out the baby with the bathwater. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yes, we can grumble about modern technology, mm. but I don't believe there was ever a golden age, mm. you know, in the past. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As I said, to me, it would be horrible to be stuck with two, say, eight back in uh, sort of our, our previous... Um, yeah, or, or die of um, uh, an append my appendix exploding. Mm. Yes, and there are perhaps things, if we knew the local plants and whatever, perhaps we'd be able to do so much. Mm. But certainly I know I'm alive today, yes, because of modern technology. Because otherwise I would have died when I had my heart attack. Mm. Yes, even 10 years ago, because of, the, of what it was like, I would have died. Well, you, could, you could reverse that and say, the way we're living today has actually caused you to have that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the, I, I see the benefit and detriment yeah, in most yeah. of these things. I think we have to be quite critical, yeah. yes, about what we take on board and what we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we have to sort the, um, the wheat from the chaff. <laughs>